So uh, the next speaker we have is Brian Schultz. Um, Brian told me last night he really doesn't like introductions, so I'll, I'll just keep it short. He's a professor at Hampshire College, and he was a PhD student with John in the 80s. I have to stand in front of this thing. Uh, how, how do they use this thing? Hampshire <laughs> College has no money. <laughs> Does this work? Can you, can you hear me now? OK. All right, so first, I have to confess that I was a teenage sociobiologist. And so. <laughs> I, that's what I wanted to do in college when I was 19. But, you know, I got, I, you know, I got disillusioned with that in grad school. And, of course, John and Science for the People was a big influence for that and getting me converted out of that and finding, you know, and I remember John saying all the time that, you know, scientists have to be responsible for the implications of their work and avoid the Werner von Braun syndrome, which was after the Tom Lehrer song, of course. You can sing along with me. Once the rockets are up, who cares where they come down? That's my, my department, says Werner von Braun. <laughs> so... Like many young people who lose their religion, I joined a cult, <laughs> the poly cult. <laughs> so I did my thesis in polycultures with John and other students at, uh, um, at Ann Arbor. And uh, we may, I was interested in variability, but we mainly did tomatoes and cucumbers, partly because John had the idea that that would be hard to mechanize and would help keep putting, from putting farm workers out of work with the, from the machines. So I guess cults tend to be a little bit Luddite. I'm told that as I took this picture, these are the other people in the group mooning the airplane. <laughs> I, I think that's John right there. But I, I can't zoom in, so I can't look. So it wasn't enough that I joined a cult. I actually have to, had to go off and join the terrorists. So at least that's what Reagan called us. I mean, it's very confusing in those days. But of course, yeah, I was one of the herd of new Aggies that went down to Nicaragua in the 80s. And I was interested in polycultures again and also working with Neem as a pest control. And I helped set up a computer room at the ISCA uh, with, uh, you know, to do statistical analysis. So, and um, of course, Catherine will talk a lot about that. So I partly tell you about all of this because I took all those influences to Hampshire College, and that's where I've been since 87. And Hampshire College is indeed a liberal arts college, but it's a very weird little one, and we're proud of that. Um, it was started by the other colleges in the 60s, and it has no grades, no credits, at least for our students. Um, you, uh, all the students, it's very project focused. I never give exams. Students all do a Div 3 or a, a big thesis project for their senior year. Um, our biggest problem is I say we have no money because we have no endowment because we're so young. When I got there, there was a farm, but there was no crops. There was a very successful livestock guarding dog project and some horses. And so I brought crops. I did projects starting with polycultures. And over the years, we've done various ones. Uh, uh, this student, oops, El Ellen Zaidlecki helped patent the earworm zeolator that we use in uh, crops in, in, for control of earworming. Um, in, in Massachusetts. I've been more interested more now in actually trap crops and organic insect repellents as kind of a push-pull system to control pests in um, uh, uh, vegetable crops. So we also, st uh, two of my Div 3 students in the 90s started a CSA. So it's now grown to about 200 members and we have a fully diversified farm now with, um, sorry, uh, lots of uh, pasture-grown animals, cows, pigs, uh, chickens, four-season greenhouses, bees, maple. And the farm's right next to campus, so it's really nice. You can take classes out there. Students can do projects there. It's very user-friendly. We also helped, with, Hampshire was one of the founding members of CESA, the Community Involved in Sustaining Agriculture, which is a pretty well-known program now for uh, encouraging local farmers, farmers to consumers, um, local purchasing, that kind of stuff. Um, Hampshire's still very interested in international programs, too. I stay interested in Central America mainly through sending students to ICADS and to work with some of you all. Um, we have a program of study abroad in Cuba. We have various programs. Uh, more recently, we've been uh, working a lot with China. We got a grant to do some collaborations. I'm taking a class there with six students next week. Um, when we go to China, one of the themes is uh, pollinators. I have two students doing Div 3s there now. The, they were part of the B-Boys that went last year. Um, and actually, at Hampshire, we're very interested in diversifying our field edges with flowers and maybe trees now, too. So I, one of the many things I like to talk about that we all talk about among other issues is complexity. And I tell students that the food webs that they learned about in school are actually pretty useful. They help you understand things like the pesticide treadmill. 
They also help you pro provide, they provide tools for biological control and other ecosystem services. And of course, the best example out there of that is John et al. And you all know who you are. Maybe a thousand students with maybe a million papers now studying everything about everything in, under, around, through, and within a hundred yards of a coffee plant with shade. <laughs> But it's really just a great source of examples. I use this paper, the bioscience paper classes all the time. But I also like, again, among many other issues, I like to talk about human food webs too. And so, for example, I start with a quote we all read in grad school from Lewinton, farming is growing peanuts, agriculture is turning um, peanuts into peanut butter, um, um, petroleum into peanut butter. So, um, you know, so he talked about the thing that everybody knows, which is like farmers have a little link in this long chain, but also, sort of the structure more, which is that there's lots of farmers and a few input suppliers, a few output buyers, and you can generalize this to consumers, and those are the bottlenecks, those are the power nodes. And so power, it's very important, I tell students, to talk about power relationships in agriculture and social issues and uh, quality of life. I like to say a, a system that's sustainable and not very pleasant and just, that's a pretty good definition of hell, right? So. It goes to the international level too, multinationals and governments are bottlenecks. And so one reason to tell people all this, and I usually have more than 20 seconds to develop all this, to get to this graph, <laughs> is that it helps you see how it all works together and also look for pressure points for solutions. So for example, CISA and CSAs try to produce, they go past these middle people to go right from farmer to consumer. Uh, farm workers do that with uh, boycotts and of course Flock went right to the power node, Campbell's, when they, you know, for their action. There's some stuff buried in here I won't have time in to get into about the different sizes of farms and how they respond to farm worker issues differently. Of course researchers like to try to break the dependence on inputs to at least some extent. You can go to government policy, um, Fair trade, at least partly, is going around those bottlenecks from consumers to farmers in other countries. Food sovereignty, at least in part, is feeding yourself first and staying out of this mess. So Newegg has been a very useful connection for me in a little college by myself in the middle of nowhere. Um, this is a picture of John uh, paying his respects to a sign about the uh, Gates Foundation in uh, the 2009 meeting, which was you know, the Newegg meeting to commemorate Dick Lewinton and Dick Levins. Um, or which we affectionately called the Two Dicks meeting. <laughs> but I like to point out, since this is John's meeting, this is a very appropriate point to point out that if Dick and Dick were the roots of Newag, John has really been the stem and the pillar. Um, Dick, Dick, and John, it's Dick, Dick, and John is starting to sound kind of biblical. <laughs> but John was certainly responsible for what I like to call the Ann Arbor diaspora, right? And he's obviously influenced a lot of you, you know. I like to think of it as a coffee ant-like colonies of closet commies creeping across the country and continents. <laughs> and you, you know who you are. <laughs> so it, we, I reach my classes all the same conclusions. I do a course called Agriculture, Ecology, and Society, which is obviously a ripped off from biology and human affairs. But you know, I, the one I draw attention to is, of course, I have to get to the fact that you really need social solutions. That you know, I, I think of John and Science for the People, and actually a lot of you all, my favorite line, sort of one of them is that one of my jobs as a scientist is to get you interested in science, which at a liberal arts college is actually the harder sell. Um, one of my responsibilities as a scientist is to get you to see that, or, and to agree that science should, isn't everything. It's not all, it's sometimes you shouldn't be chasing technological solutions when there's really better and more appropriate and much more effective um, solutions in social change.